<laughs> oh, goodness. Are we all set? <laughs> all good? Okay, fantastic. Well, first, let me, uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining the Minister of Education and myself. That's, uh, of course, Demetrius Nicolaitis for this exciting announcement. I also want to thank everyone on the board of Grassland School Division and the staff here at Brooks Junior High for, th for hosting us today. So I'm thrilled so many could join us here today, including board chair Pat O'Connor, vice chair Melanie Reed Zakowski, trustee Linda Morey, uh, assistant superintendent Sean Beaton, manager of facilities Alan Hepner, Brooks Junior High School principal Jarrett Hoffer, Hofer, I think I've got a couple more here. Ahmed Kassem, I see you there, a trustee, as well as uh, Mayor John Petrie as well. So sorry if I've missed anyone, but uh, we'll, But if I have, I'm sure that the minister will make sure I fill in the blanks. We've all heard the news that Alberta is growing at unseen, uh, an unseen pace uh, in decades. Uh, Brooks is growing too, of course, and that includes our student population. And although it might be hard to tell right now, since students are currently enjoying their their spring break, uh, their spring break, this is a bustling school right now. Brooks Junior High is the education home of a growing number of newcomers. For a full 28 percent of the student population, English is not their first language, and many of those came without previous formal school experience. Our community has been waiting for a replacement school for Brooks Junior High, the one, the only standalone junior high in town because they need the space and it needs the maintenance. <laughs> As I've learned, Brooks Junior High is over 70 years old, having been built in 1953. Over the years, it received three expansions, all evidence of a growing community. And that growing community has led to this division popping up uh, this project on the list of priorities for the Grassland School Division. Last year in Budget 2023, our government provided funding to design a new school to replace the school we are in right now. And just over a month ago in Budget 2024, we advanced this project and today I am pleased to confirm that we are fully funding the replacement of the construction for Brooks Junior High. Our funding for this school signifies our government's commitment to provide world-class education for all of our children. It is one of 43 school projects across the province included in this year's budget and one of a total of 98 projects that are in various stages. Even more, it's a commitment to ensuring that today's students find their own path that moves them ever closer to their goals, whatever that may be. Schools are a place where imaginations are sparked and young minds take flight. That is why it's so important that school buildings keep pace with the growing population of students and meet the diverse needs of students and their families. I'm proud to say that our government released a responsible plan in budget 2024 that puts Albertans and families first and takes real action to address our growing province. It invests in strong health care and provides support to keep life affordable. And as demonstrated here today, it commits to a bright future for our, our children with new and modernized schools and learning supports for students of all abilities. Once complete, the new Brooks Junior High School will provide a bright, modern, and inspiring learning environment for students. It will continue to serve as a hub for the community and providing a welcoming space for families to gather, support their kids, and socialize with their neighbors. And it will be built with an eye to the future. Its design will provide the new school with the capacity to educate and inspire even more students and meet the need of a wider community for generations to come. So I do look forward to seeing the next steps in this project as it moves towards construction. And I look forward to celebrating when the doors do officially open. This will be a wonderful space for all students of all abilities and backgrounds, as well as for the dedicated teachers who will continue to educate and inspire these young minds inside brand new walls. Thank you to the teachers. Thank you to Grassland School Division Board and anyone who has worked so hard to bring this all together. And once again, congratulations on the new Brooks Junior High. Uh, thank you. And I will invite Minister Nicolaitis to speak more about it. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you immensely, uh, Premier, for this uh, really exciting and important announcement uh, for, for Brooks and the, the broader community. As uh, the Premier noted, of course, uh, this funding today is to build a replacement Brooks Junior High School. And of course, I think we can all agree, is certainly exciting news for students and families here in Brooks. Uh, I also want to join the Premier in thanking the board at uh, Grasslands Sc uh, School Division trustees, uh, superintendents, um, staff, and teachers uh, broadly in the school division for all of the incredible work that you do every single day to ensure that students at Grassland School receive a world-class education. Thank you immensely 
for your efforts. It's greatly acknowledged and appreciated. This new school will be built right here on the very same site that we're standing on today. And when it is fully built out, we will have 157 more student spaces to allow for future enrollment growth. While project timelines are still to be ironed out and finalized, we do anticipate the new school could be in a position to be open for students starting the 27 to 28 school year. I'm confident that our investments in priority projects like a new Brooks Junior High School and our record high funding level for education that's been provided in Budget 24 will ensure that we set all students up for a pathway of lifelong success. Budget 24 works to support a world-class education for all children by investing in new and modernized schools and as well by providing support to our education partners to address rising enrollment and as well to continue to meet the unique needs and diverse needs of all of our students in the classroom. With $2.1 billion earmarked for school projects over the next three years, Budget 24 means students and families across Alberta can look forward to more and new modernized schools in their community. Including the replacement school project right here in Brooks, Budget 24 funds 11 different school projects in communities outside of the Calgary and Edmonton metropolitan areas for a total of 43 projects. When all of these projects are completed, it will provide a total of 35,000 new and modernized spaces for Alberta students, while at the same time revitalizing our communities and of course, creating jobs. In total, as Premier noted, there are now a total of 98 school projects in the pipeline. On the operating side, Budget 24 invests a record $9.3 billion in education this year alone, with 98% of those funds going directly to our school authorities like Grasslands to continue to provide a world-class education and to serve our students. I am confident that the education funding that we are providing through Budget 24 will provide a world-class education that sets our students on a pathway of success. Thank you, uh, Premier. Thank you to all of you for joining us here today for this important announcement. Thank you once again to our teachers, our support staff, our leaders who work hard every day to create a bright future for our students and the future of our province. It's now my pleasure to pass uh, remarks over to Pat Connor chair of Grasslands Public Schools. Thank you. Oh, wait. I, had it open I had it open and ready to go. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, whatever the case may be. Uh, firstly, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Premier Smith and, and Education Minister uh, Nicolaitis to City of Brooks, the County of Newell, home of Grassland School Division. As was mentioned, my name is Pat Connor. I'm chair of the Board of Trustees. And on their behalf and the, uh, on behalf of senior administration and staff, I'd like to express our gratitude and appreciation to the government of Alberta for this uh, approval of a replacement school for Brooks Junior High School. We are all indeed very excited about the, the possibility of this new school and, and the, the opportunities it will offer, but I don't think there's anyone more excited than Principal Jared Hofer. <laughs> this new facility uh, will provide ease of accessibility, will provide additional space uh, to allow grasslands and their teachers to, in the words of our minister, provide a world-class education. Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes the formal portion of today's announcement. We'll start with questions. If we want to start in the room, we'll start with your first name. Yeah, um, and your outlet. Hi, Sandra Sandway, Brooks Hi. Bulletin. Good morning. 
Could you please tell me what the funding amount is for this school? I should have the exact funding amount uh, here in front of me, but if I don't, happy to, to follow up with you and give you the, the exact amount. Um, but uh, I'm pretty sure I have it in my notes here somewhere, unless Pat uh, recalls specifically the, the exact amount for it. I'll have to g give me a, a couple of minutes and I'll follow up with you on the exact dollar amount. And just as a follow-up, please, um, will that amount include any amenities, i.e. playgrounds? I know it's a junior high school, but there's a football field here that's in question as well as a track and field field? Yes, yeah, so typically with, uh, with modernization, or excuse me, with replacements, uh, there, there is capacity to include uh, playgrounds, but broadly, of course, the funding is for the development of the new school and, and the infrastructure. Uh, but there can be circumstances when there is a replacement project for funding to be provided for uh, playgrounds specifically. Uh, I know there's, there's broader other amenities that are usually included around school sites, but specifically with regards to playgrounds, those can often be included in replacement projects. Wonderful. Thank you. Did we have another question in the room here? Eli Ritter, Chat News for the Premier. Um, I just want to ask a question about related to, to Medicine Hat. And um, so recently you said you consider making changes to the recall legislation uh, when it comes to municipalities. Uh, there's been sort of some controversy happening with uh, the Medicine Hat governance right now um, in terms of the mayor and getting sanctioned. A lot of the residents in Medicine Hat are upset about that or for that. Um, there's just a lot of feelings uh, related to that. Do you have any response to that, um, considering a lot of those are you know, part of your writing? There's a couple of things I'd say. On the issue of recall, what we've learned is that the initial legislation that we had set the bar a bit high, unrealistically so, and I think it's created frustration on the part of citizens that if you set a, a rule in place, it, it should be reasonably achievable. We did indicate that we, we wouldn't be changing any of the thresholds until the active recall petitions were all complete. And so we'll begin that process to see if there's a, another bar. The issue that we had is we set it based on 40% of population, which of course includes a whole pile of people who can't vote, whether they're because they're newcomers or because they're under the age of 18. And so just on a review of, of how it's uh, worked in practice, there's some, there's some uh, modifications that we believe need to be made, but we want to do a little more consultation on that. When it comes to the issue of uh, code of conduct, the legislation requires all boards to have those. But I, I must say I'm a bit concerned that it seems to me that the code of conduct is often being used to have one council member fight with another council member, and that's not what it's supposed to be for. It's supposed to be making sure that a person in their position is doing something in an ethical way and not, and not to using the position to further their own personal interests. So I've asked our minister to make sure that we're um, looking at the legislation to see if we need to give better guidelines because it, it really shouldn't be used as a way of, of just scoring political points from one council member who disagrees with another. So at the moment, I, I'm you know, monitoring it, but I, I think that from what I've seen, it looks like we need to, to make a, a few more guardrails around how, how, how code of conducts are, are, are exercised. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll do one more in the room here, and then we'll move over to the phones. Hi, Todd from CTV. Do you feel that the federal government is overstepping the province to provide recent housing packages? Would you like that to be handled differently? Well, look, I like some of the things that the, the prime minister is announcing. But what I would say is that just a few months ago, he said that this wasn't federal jurisdiction, that it was up to the provinces. And now that he's in trouble in the polls, now he's racing to, it looks like, do five announcements a day. Some of them, I think, will work for, look to work, work with him collaboratively. Like, for instance, the announcement today where there will be a bank of designs for manufactured and modular homes. I've been talking to my minister about that. I think that there's some wisdom in that. That being said, de designs need to be able to fit into our climate. And so um, being, being able to have access to the expertise at the federal level is great, but it does require a local lens to make sure it works for us. What, I have, what I'm particularly concerned about, though, is that the federal government, when they come in and they do unilateral deals um, or bilateral deals with municipalities, they leave a lot of municipalities out. And we have 355 municipalities that all have different degrees of pressure because of the need for housing. 
And yet with the federal government choosing who they have political relationships with and granting, making grants on that basis, it's very political and it doesn't meet the need. So that's why we want to partner with them in the same way that Quebec has. In Quebec, um, they can't go around the uh, provincial government to, to, to make uh, special deals with individual municipalities. They have to work with the province and then the province and the feds together decide where those dollars need to go when it gets down to the municipality. I think that that's a healthier model. And then finally, I would say I'm gravely concerned that this is really just a mechanism to try to implement net zero housing policies. That uh, we determined a building code that makes sense for our environment knowing that we have natural gas as the base fuel for heat, that natural gas remains the base fuel for our electricity, and we are not going to chase after a couple of dollars if it means hamstringing our ability to build the kind of housing that we need to, um, nor do we want to take a little bit of a few dollars if it's going to result in tens or twenties or thirty thousand dollars of additional cost on homes. That kind of defeats the purpose of trying to get affordable housing. So some things, sure, we can work with them, but uh, I think they've overstepped the mark once again, as they often do. And uh, with the natural gas plants down causing rolling blackouts, um, is the AESO failing in management of the system? Well, look, the, we, we have created a structure that gives priority to wind and solar. And when wind and solar don't materialize, it takes a couple of hours to power up our natural gas. We've built the system completely backwards. And that's what we have been identifying as a problem, that we need to build the system based on base load power. Because as I understand it, there were certain forecasts about what solar would do today and what wind would do today. They didn't pan out. And then it takes a couple of hours for our natural gas to power up and get to full steam. It really should be the opposite. We should be able to rely on a certain amount of base load power and then have a, um, another way of approaching the, the issue of intermittency. So this is at the heart of everything that we've been saying for the last year, that the, uh, the system is broken. It needs to be repaired. We need to be focused on base load power and reliable and affordable energy. And we're going to continue going down that path. Thank you. We're going to move over to the phones now. Operator, if you could put through the first caller. Lisa Johnson, Canadian Press. Hi, thanks for taking my question. I apologize if it's off topic. Um, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was uh, responding a little bit this morning to your recent calls on the carbon tax. I'm hoping to get your response to that. I, I apologize, I don't have the transcription right in front of me, so I'm just kind of paraphrasing here. But he basically said premiers have already been extensively consulted on this issue. And he also pointed to that video that we've seen circulating in which you, um, Premier, spoke positively about the rebates. I believe it was from 2021 when you were not yet the Premier. Um, what is your response to, to that? Well, if he has to point to a comment I made three years ago, it clearly shows he can't defend his current position. And he can't. Because you have to recall a few years ago, they had also promised that the carbon tax would be no higher than $50 per ton. It was also prior to having emissions caps, methane caps, net zero power grids, phasing out cars, phasing out um, uh, the traditional style of homes. So he's continued to pile on on additional costs over the last few years, which has completely changed the calculus. And now that we are at $80 per ton, on the way to $170 per ton, and even his own parliamentary budget office has said that uh, that to jurisdictions like Alberta has our people pay, paying more, $900 more on average, going up to $2,700 more than they get in a rebate. Um, it, it throws his argument out the window, I'm afraid, that uh, when I made my comments, I was comparing what he had initially proposed to what the NDP had done. When the NDP came through with their carbon tax, they only rebated a third back to the lowest income household and they capped two thirds of it in general revenues. So that was a really terrible way of putting in the carbon tax, but um, also hiking it up beyond what people can afford to pay, not rebate, rebating it back um, 100%, that's also a terrible way to, to manage a carbon tax. On top of that, our small businesses are getting crushed by this because they keep on going up. They don't do rebates to small business or large business, and all of those costs end up getting ha uh, handed down in the cost of, of the goods that, that people buy. And that's the reason why we continue to have an inflation crisis. So I, I think he should look at the reality of today what he's delivered, the impact it's having, and he should heed the calls that what he's doing is not affordable. And, and people are telling him in so many ways, uh, in so many different provinces, with different political parties, that um, it's, it's not just me saying it, it's 70% it's of, of Canadians saying it. Lisa, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, I just wanted to say that I think that the, the 
Yeah, thanks very much for that. Um, also, sorry, unrelated question, but I know your your minister yesterday spoke uh, a little bit more about your, your plans to create Recovery Alberta and CORE, mm -hmm. but I'm hoping just to get your response to some of the comments the NDP has made about CORE specifically. They Yesterday, their critic called it another war room funded by taxpayers to promote ideology and spin the UCP's narrative. How, how would you respond to, I guess, concerns that this is just a PR exercise and collecting talking points to support policy decisions that have already been made? Well, um, I reject what they're saying uh, because we need to do good research. As you try a different approach, you need to see what's working. And if it's working, you need to do more of it. And if things aren't working, you need to try other approaches. Um, so quite frankly, Alberta is a leader in putting an emphasis on recovery. And by putting that emphasis on recovery, we want to do some measurement. We want to, now that we've got people going through our recovery communities, we want to know what happens to them. Now that we've got 8,000 people on our virtual opioid dependency program, we, we want to know what happens to them. And we want to be able to share that with the world. So that's just uh, that's good academic research. This, the NDP normally supports science. I'm not sure why they don't in this case. Operator, could you put through the next caller? Janet French, CBC. Hi there. You know I love a good education story, but I've actually got to ask about power today for the premier. Sure. Um, in your tweet, you said, or your ex post, whatever, you said the government is committed to ensuring the province generates reliable baseload power now and in the future. Well, we saw this morning, as far as I understand from talking to electrical experts, is five natural gas plants and a coal plant all trip offline unexpectedly. And this week, the weather is not even particularly hot or cold, so demand isn't what we saw in January. And we've got these two grid alerts and requests for brownouts. Like, what immediate measures? foresee taking to ensure that the lights are going to stay on? Well, as I understand it, they uh, had a certain projection for what wind and solar would be today, So, um, and it didn't pan out. And as a result, they had to ask for the powering up of those natural gas plants. And as they were coming on, uh, you're, you're quite right that there was uh, something that tripped and they weren't able to come on at the at the speed with which we needed them to. So this is, you have to remember the way the system used to work. The way the system used to work, it was 90% base load power on coal. And when you had coal on, it wasn't coming on and off and you weren't having to take hours to be able to power it up. That was the, that was the very definition of base load power and the very definition of stability. What we're trying to do is match our natural gas to jack up and go down on the basis of whether sun jacks up uh, and goes down and wind jacks up and goes down. And it's creating these gaps. And part of the gap is either filled by higher spike in prices, and people are seeing that on the power bill, or it's being... Uh, or we're ending up with this system instability. Not, neither of those are, are, uh, are what we want. So we are going to change the system so that we incentivize that base load reliable power. The minister has talked about having a day ahead market so that we know who is going to be down, who is going to be on so that we can actually plan the reliability. And we'll be working on making sure that we bring on more natural gas. We're, um, we're seeing a couple of, na of companies that are investing in small modular nuclear. That's a, a sort of a longer term solution 10 years from now. But uh, we know that in this market, with how quickly we can get uh, baseload power on it, it's going to have to be natural gas. It's going to have to be solar and wind where they can back be backed up either by peaker plants, which are natural gas, or by um, by some kind of storage mechanism. So those are the things that we're looking at in the immediate term. We're still in the process of rolling out the the startup of those 2,700 megawatts of natural gas that's, that is going to be coming on be between now and the end of the year. So uh, we're still in that period where we're waiting for all of those to be available to us. But I, I think this just underscores we can't build an electricity city system on nothing but wind and solar. It just is impossible. We have to be able to have enough base load power and it has to be on, on a consistent basis in order to give those companies the return that they need so that we're not seeing these, these re reliability problems. Janet, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, my understanding is also that Alberta is not fully using its intertie capacity mm -hmm. with British Columbia and Montana. And, you know, there's even some suggestions perhaps we should have a duplicate intertie with northern BC. Um, what interest do you have in trying to pursue more construction of more interties? And what, why are we limiting what's being used on interties right now? 
Uh, our interest is very high, and uh, it's not just with BC, it's also with Saskatchewan, and certainly with Montana. The issue we have with British Columbia is that uh, it's not really a, a it's not really a, a, um, a fair relationship. That when they buy from us, they buy at uh, zero <laughs> power, and when we buy from them, we're competing with California, which can buy up to uh, which can see prices go up to five thousand dollars per megawatt hour. And so that's part of the issue is we don't actually have an agreement with British Columbia where they would give us priority. So oftentimes when we need them, they're in high demand either for their own use or they're exporting to the United States. It's why we need a couple of other options, Saskatchewan being one, and then being able to sell directly to the United States is another. And so there'll be more on that um, uh, reasonably soon from a, an announcement point of view, but but uh, we were in agreement that that was one of the things that my minister identified as one of the early ways that we'd be able to create the stability we're looking for. Operator, if you could put through the next caller. Sarah Offen, Global News. Hi there. Um, I just wanted to, again, just touch base on the, the, the blackout and grid alerts. I mean, at the same time, we have some of the highest prices across the country for electricity, but we're also seeing a poor reliability. I'm just wondering um, how the redesign is going to um, address that? Uh, is it going to drive up market market kind of competition? And um, is it time to, to look at moving back to a regulated market? We don't want to move back to a regulated market, but there's a there are some things that we can do to create uh, stability. Uh, everything is interconnected is part of the issue. Um, so we've got issues that we're dealing with with the cost of local franchise fees. We've got issues that we're dealing with the regulated rate option. We've got issues that we're dealing with with the cost of distribution, issues that we're dealing with with what has been the overbuild on transmission, the intermittency of solar and wind, as well as uh, waiting for sufficient natural gas to come on stream. And so there's a number of policies that we'll be putting in place to address all of that. Minister Newdorf gave a, an indication of the direction that we were going in the speech that he gave to the power, the um, Independent Power Producers Association meeting, I believe it was, on March the 11th. You may want to go back and you may want to go and have a look at that for a few more details. But uh, essentially, what we're aiming to do is ensure that we have enough base load power and increasing at a reasonable rate, so that we can continue to meet the the need on the highest demand day. So we now know that our highest demand day is 12,252 megawatts. And um, we didn't have any wind or solar on those days. So that's what we're trying to build, is we need to know what our, our worst day is going to be without having any wind or solar, because that's often what happens when it's minus 35 at five o'clock at night, is you can't rely on the intermittent sources. Um, so I would anticipate what you'll see is that there'll be um, a decision for us to be adding a thousand megawatts or more a year every single year and then have wind and solar um, on to supplement as long as they can have the the base load backup of either a peaker plant or a battery or stored or or, or water storage so that's the method that's the the way that we're going to be moving forward uh, we have a projection that we're going to need twenty five thousand megawatts by 2050 so if you just uh, look at where we're at now that's uh, that's kind of the the pace at which we're going to have to grow and as new technologies become available uh, then uh, we'll be able to add them to the mix, like small modular nuclear, and then we'll be able to augment with, uh, as I was discussing in the previous answer, with interties, so that we can make sure that we're able to bring on emergency power in times when it's needed. Sarah, did you have a follow-up? Nothing to follow. Thank you. Thank you. And then we've got time for one more question, and we'll do that. I should just mention, since there's so many electricity questions, I believe ISO is doing a, um, a media availability at 2 o'clock today. So I'll just flag that for you so that you can get a, um, more of a direct update as we, as we roll forward throughout the day. Uh, as I understand it, even though uh, we've been on and off uh, series, a series alerts throughout the, the full morning, there is the potential that we're going to have that same pressure going into when we have high demand in the evening hours. So I'll just make the, uh, uh, that note to you that I, I believe ISO at 2 o'clock will be, will be having more to say on that. We just want people to be watching their power use today. Brandon Smedley with uh, Stingray Radio here in Brooks. 
Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Premier. Uh, you mentioned that Alberta is growing at a very rapid rate, uh, and especially in the larger cities, and even here in Brooks, but maybe not as much as other rural municipalities, because the big thing uh, that was questioned earlier is housing. Uh, many people are wanting to move from Calgary due to lack of affordability to rural places, and we've seen in some instances, people even turned away because they can't find housing. I even being one of those people taking three months to find mm. an affordable apartment uh, here in Brooks. Um, if I remember correctly, back at the State of the Region address in January that you attended, uh, they were the mention of local initiatives to in, uh, promote housing builds with tax cuts at a local level and stuff like that. And you mentioned the possibility of matching that at a provincial level. Mm -hmm. Has your government looked into that in matching that for the city of Brooks or other ruling municipalities? Or if not, are there other steps? To I, I think that housing? Brooks has uh, taken a really interesting approach to be able to incentivize construction. And I've asked my municipal affairs minister to look at, at whether or not we can come in and, and assist in matching that. There are lots of things that we can do. One of the things that we have been asking as well is to remove some of the barriers to, to increasing the uh, supply of, of housing. And there's something in the order of 6,400 different regulatory requirements that have been removed from the Municipal Act to make that happen. And it's, it's, uh, it's demonstrating that it's working. We've now got the second highest number of housing starts um, in both Calgary and Edmonton than we've seen historically. So th that's a positive sign. Um, when it comes to the uh, rural environment, I, I have a number of people who have suggested to me that uh, we need to uh, be a, create some, some special pathways for the small builders and for the owner builders as well. And we're taking a look at the new home warranty program as a way of, of trying to see if we can streamline that process so that we're not adding a bunch of additional cost. Uh, that I think the implementation of that has been problematic in the rural areas. Um, we're also looking at ways that we can build more manufactured home and modular homes because uh, it, it's, it's, qu it's quite true that if you can build those and then have them transported, that would be um, an efficient way to be able to get um, an additional housing stock. So I've been asking my minister to see if we can start working on some of those uh, potentials, and it sounds like the, the federal government's aligned on that too. So I, I think that everybody from the municipal to the provincial to the federal government are fully aligned on trying to find some of these solutions. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Did you have a follow-up? That concludes today's press conference. Thanks, Thank you so much.